So I want to bring up, and I am proud um, and have a pleasure to bring up, somebody who knows a little bit about surviving and thriving. Please welcome um, the actor and author and strong CH supporter, Evan Handler. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening. It's the after dinner portion of the evening. I feel like there should be a burlesque show now, a burlesque element to what's coming. Um, did everyone have enough to eat? Yes. Does anyone want seconds? No one. Good, because I don't know how to get them for you. I haven't got a clue. It's not my department. Um, this has struck me as a very Colorado background to the evening. Anyone else? <laughs> it's been a long time for me, but it used to be. I feel contaminated sitting now, you know, from the cushions of the chair. I, I'm, I'm, I worry what my clothing is doing to me at the moment. I want to go home and take a shower. I want to get naked. Um, but then the water will poison me anyway. Um, I want to thank Michael Green and CEH for asking me to come here tonight because it's extremely meaningful for me to have the opportunity to talk about the work they do and what it means to me personally. Now, some of you may be familiar with me, some may not. I've got, a, uh, I think, a pretty split demographic. Um, a certain number of people know me as the bald guy from Sex and the City. Um, <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'm milking applause by doing this now. Um, other people want to refer to me as the bald Jewish guy from Sex and the City. It's like pride of ownership or something, I don't know. And others like to think of me, I think, as the bald Jewish naked guy from Sex and the City. Um, then there's a whole other set who know me from Californication where uh, uh, getting naked was the least of my challenges. Um, but I'm also the author of two books, each of which deals in its own way with my history of having gotten well from a very serious case of acute myeloid leukemia in the mid-1980s, when it was still considered to be incurable. And a hush comes over the crowd. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, I heard a whole lot of cliches and aphorisms back then and in the years since about illness and recovery. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people would tell me that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, my own experience has been that what doesn't kill you fucks you up for a really long time. And, and, and it's just a miracle if you ever get it back together again. Um, I'm pleased to report that a lot more people get well from leukemia and the things like it now than they used to, but that's very different from a lot less people getting sick with them in the first place, and that would be a much better goal. Um, so to go back a bit further, I grew up about an hour's drive north of New York City in an area we call the Hudson Valley. It was, and it still is, Hudson Valley gets a round of applause, um, a very idyllic setting. The house I lived in through the 1970s, though, does happen to sit just down the road from a nuclear power plant. And the kids I went to school with were all the children and grandchildren of the same people who threw ro rocks, rioted, and overturned buses in 1949 when Paul Robeson came to sing One Town Over in Peekskill, New York. Now, Paul Robeson had already given concerts in Peekskill peacefully in the past, but in the years leading up to this one, he'd spoken out several times against the Ku Klux Klan, and apparently that was just a step too far. An avowed African-American communist is one thing, but an avowed African-American communist who speaks out against the Klan has got to be shut down. So even idyllic settings can have their downsides. Uh, I don't know why I came down with leukemia when I was 24 years old. My own intuition tells me that growing up three miles from a nuclear power plant is probably not the best way to avoid health problems. But I also wouldn't recommend the game that my brother and sister and I used to play every Tuesday evening in the summers. That was the night when the fog man made his rounds. The man wasn't the object of our interest. What captivated us was the small green tractor-like vehicle that he drove. This tractor moved slowly along the side of the winding road while the chute protruding from the backside spewed insecticide in billowing plumes up into the shrubs and trees. When we heard the fog man rounding the bend, we would sneak out one of the back doors of our house. Hiding in the bushes, we would watch as he pulled over onto the dirt shoulder of the road and blasted the moist white smoke from the asshole of his engine. We would pull our t-shirts over our mouths and noses, and giggling and shrieking, we would run and play in the mist. 
We would follow him from house to house, trying to get as close to the thickest meat of the fog as we could. We'd become lost in the clouds, unable to locate each other with our eyes until we escaped, choking, spent and out of breath. 17 years later, in the midst of my medical treatments, I celebrated a birthday with a small group of friends who'd all grown up within a few miles of each other. In the group of six men and women, all under the age of 30, three of them had been treated for some form of cancer. But I really don't mean to be here tonight as a survivor or a celebrity. I'm, I'm not here as a scientist or a politician. I'm here as a parent. I'm here as the father of seven-year-old Sophia Clementina Handler. And I'm here to say, as her father, that I am fucking pissed off. I'm pissed off that 35 years after I chased the Fogman, during my last years as a resident of New York City, I was one of the very few people who spent two summers booking hotel rooms all over Manhattan, trying to escape exposure to the Malathion being sprayed nightly in various neighborhoods in an insane attempt to kill every mosquito because a few unlucky people contracted West Nile virus. I'm pissed off that a decade after that, I can't buy a piece of furniture for my home that hasn't been soaked to saturation with toxic chemicals that have been proven to be both harmful and useless. This list could go on. The fact is, in spite of evidence and knowledge stacking up in favor of massive changes to the way we live our lives and conduct business, we're still making the same mistakes as when I was my daughter's age. And I think rage is an appropriate response for a parent. Fortunately, there exists an organization called CEH, the Center for Environmental Health. CEH uses legal action, along with proactive engagement of corporations, to influence them toward the removal of toxic chemicals from their supply chains. That's a wonderful euphemism, isn't it? To influence them. Um, 30 staff member organization affecting public policy and changing the behaviors of mammoth corporations to the benefit of every American. CEH works to turn rage like mine and the donations it can inspire. <laughs> I never saw an auction of nothing before. That was amazing to me. I, I mean, I was, I said, but wait a minute, where are the prizes? They're auctioning nothing and people are bidding. It was astonishing. <laughs> Um, it's our job tonight and every day going forward to enrage and outrage others enough to get them to open their wallets to CEH as well. And more than that, because that's not enough. We've got to enrage and outrage and engage people to the point where they will stand up en masse and say, we don't care how much of our taxes you pay for us or how cheap you make our electricity. We don't care how cheap or how pretty you make our corn. This is the air we breathe and it's got to be clean. This is the food we eat and it's got to nourish and not poison. We've got to succeed in getting an overwhelming majority to start to say we have had enough, this has gone on for too long already, and now it has got to stop. So I'm here tonight to salute CEH and to thank them on behalf of my daughter for their work in moving us closer to that day. Thank you very much. And now, it is my great honor to introduce a man who boasts a 16-year career in the U.S. Congress and who has made two historic runs for the Democratic presidential nomination. He is a devoted defender of our air, water, and land, and an icon to everyone who understands the value of speaking essential truths. You can see him these days speaking the truth as a contributor on Fox News. Please welcome our keynote speaker this evening, Mr. Dennis Kucinich.